Okay, <clears throat> this is going to be a, a, a bit of a mixed lecture because I'm going to be going through some points on, um, on, theory, on, on philosophy and theory and other points on mathematics. Now, who here has done any work in differential equations? Quite a few, okay. And you've, you've done an engineering degree and we have the physics and... Pardon? In, in, sorry? I was making financial mathematics. Oh, okay. So you've done that at that stage. Okay. But who hasn't done any differential equations? Okay. So I've got this mixed group to, to go through, and I'm going to be... I'm not quite certain how to handle that part of the course, because I wrote... What I've written is stuff for stuff people know a fair bit about it. So I've got to go backwards to some extent before I do that. But I'll, I'll start by talking about um, the whole idea of developing an alternative approach to doing macroeconomics to the neoclassicals. Because one thing they do have the great advantage they have is a shared theory of value. And out of that theory of value, they all can have a conversation where they accept the foundation stones on whatever somebody else's new paper does. So there's shared stepping stones, and then on you go from there. In the post-Keynesian world, there is no such shared foundation, not to the same degree. There's a, a commonality, but not a shared foundation. So I want to talk about um, a, a methodology that I think can work for anybody from a post-Keynesian point of view. How to, as an alternative perspective to the way the neoclassicals work. But I'll start with what they do. And of course, they have a, a shared theory of value, which is this, this idea of subjective utility, maximization of subjective utility, subject to constraints, which is fundamentally decide, describes the, the foundation from which all their model building goes. And Janis Varoufakis and uh, I think it's Chris Asperger, Arnsberger, wrote a nice paper about what is neoclassical economics some time ago and saying these are what they saw as the defining features of it. So they all start from the idea of methodological individualism. You have a, uh, you, you start from the individual level and you work up and you can find Krugman saying exactly the same thing, uh, the same concept, no, not, not uh, of course, with, with an argument that it's a good idea rather than Farrafakis and Ernsberger saying it's a poor idea. So they start from the individual and they work out what is the behavior of the individual, what are the constraints, what are the motivations on the individual, and then have them optimizing to some degree or various other things other than op optimizing turning up there, but that's the basic starting point. It's also instrumental. You say there's preference satisfaction. It's the vision they're after. And it's all about equilibrium, method methodological equilibration, as Janus calls it here. They pose a standard question, what behavior should we expect in equilibrium? Because that is seen as being the, the, the state towards which the system is going to head. Now, as Janus puts it, the, the question of whether an equilibrium is likely or probable, or how it might turn up is turned as an optional extra. You never really go through and see what are the conditions required for that. And that certainly applies to DSGE models, which when you look at the equilibria, it's actually unstable. Okay? Mathematically speaking, it's unstable. They've got to talk about some behavior uh, by individuals that manages to jump around a map to find a route that is unstable. And that's a, it actually happens, a, there's a big computational problem for them, uh, which they've solved, of course, but it's all about computational understanding an entire phase space to work out where the one stable bit is. One thing that wasn't in that article is what I think is another very important part of it. It's all about barter. It's two parties, two goods, relative prices, not three parties, one good and monetary prices. Um, and that's that's the whole of it. You know, I went through last week with some of the nonsense they've done about how they're trying to get around central banks saying that um, uh, you banks create money. You get Krugman say it doesn't make any difference, shrugging his shoulders and ignoring it. And you get Fire and, and Gerbash saying, so long as you're willing to assume that there's no uncertainty and therefore no bank defaults, they're equivalent. Let's use the simpler one. Yeah, right. Okay. Um, and if they do bring a finance at all, you'll see it turning up as financial frictions. And that was, if you saw that, remember that set of papers I showed you from Oxford uh, Economic Policy Review. They all talked about the need to incorporate financial frictions in the model. They don't even think about why not financial lubricants. Okay, it's financial frictions, things that slow down a return to equilibrium. So that's their way of thinking. Now, <clears throat> I see complex systems as an alternative, an overarching alternative for a non-orthodox, non-neoclassical way of modelling the economy, and it starts effectively with methodological collectivism, rather than saying you work with individuals. You have to work at the level of social aggregates. And this is something which the neoclassicals themselves proved and then ignored. This is the, has, has anybody read any of the papers on the Sonnenschein Mount Algebra Theorem? Anybody? Okay. They're not exactly easy to read. They involve a high level of 
of mathematics, sometimes set theory and things like that are used to explain it. <coughs> Pardon me. But I basically see it as a proof by contradiction that you can't scale from the individual to a, class, to a collective that behaves in the same way the individual does, meaning the law of demand fails. That's fundamentally what it says. If you have consumers uh, with different tastes and different income sources and commodities with different characteristics, you will not be able to derive a downward sloping demand curve. Okay? You'll get something else, which can be polynomial fit. It's not saying actual demand curves are like that, but working from neoclassical theory where they don't talk about the income relationship between agents, okay? that's not brought up. You might talk about the income of an agent. You might say the income comes from labour or capital, etc., etc. But you don't talk about the relative income of those groups. What this theorem shows is because changing relative prices changes income distribution in the aggregate when you're working with more than one isolated agent, then you can't get the law of demand out of it. You don't get a downward sloping demand curve necessarily. You get any shape you can draw with a polynomial. Now, Alan Kerman made the only um, in, the lit in the neoclassical literature, the only sensible reaction I've seen to that. And he said, this is telling us that if we want to progress further, we have to start with the idea of groups that have collectively coherent behaviour. There must be some reasonable level of aggregation from which we start modelling. For example, workers, capitalists and bankers. It's not a bad start. Okay? And the idea we can start at the isolated individual is one we all may have to abandon. That was Kerman back in uh, 1989. He's since given up on the neoclassicals, uh, but that was, I think, the, the honest response to that particular theorem was that there was no way to go from the theory of an individual to the theory of a market, let alone to go from the theory of an individual to the theory of an economy. That they they bull, well, yeah, they bullshitted their way to say that they could do it, and this is actually, when you think about it, this actually confirms the classical schools theory, because the classical school talked in terms of social classes. Marx had workers and capitalists, Ricardo had workers, capitalists and uh, landlords. The idea of social classes was an essential part of the classical methodology. Uh, whereas the neoclassicals have gone without that. And another one I've added to, uh, to uh, the, my preferred thing is we have to have his history and institutions in the way we think about the behaviour of the economy. And this is a quote from Marx in the 18th premier of Louis, Napole uh, Louis Bonaparte. Men make their own history, but not as they please. You don't talk about, in other words, in addition to talking about income constraints, there are also social, political and historical constraints. The time at which you act affects how you can act. And this is again minimised by neoclassicals who have an ahistorical view of the past, minimised by Austrians too for that matter. But fundamentally we have to see ourselves being in history at some point and going forward. And complexity. Everything's happening far from equilibrium. The whole idea that equilibrium is where we are is just wrong in a complex system. And I'll show you some, some technical reasons as to why I can say that later on in the lecture and in the, in the next lecture. But it's also, I haven't actually included this in the lectures yet, but Janos Kornai wrote a wonderful book called Anti-Equilibrium back in the late, uh, the late 60s, early 70s. And one of his points was, equilibrium is not a desirable state in its own right. That you get more innovation. If you see, he talked about what he called pressure and said that when there's excess, when there's demand pressure on the economy, so when demand, when a shortage of demand drives what happens, you've got more than enough capacity to supply, but it's getting enough aggregate demand is not there. That puts a pressure from demand to mean if you want to as an as a individual capitalist, or in, uh, if you wish to succeed, you have to capture that share of aggregate demand from somebody else. Whereas there's too much, if, there's excess, if, there's, if demand is too full, which was the Soviet system, ironically, where everybody had enough income to buy whatever was produced, but whatever was produced was inadequate, in that situation you said you get no pressure to innovate. And that was his main explanation of why the Soviet Union declined because with um, full employment of resources and with everybody having enough money to buy everything and more, the solution was queuing to get things. Wait seven years to get a television set. That, by the way, is, uh, was, is it's not a joke. 
uh, one of my friends from Romania was in precisely that situation and typical her, she countermanded it by going on an international mission to America and buying one and bringing it back on the plane with it. But if you're waiting for a TV in the Soviet Union, you waited up to seven years. Um, therefore, there's no pressure to innovate the nature of TVs. So this is Corno's explanation for why you got slow growth in the Soviet system was that it was supply constrained rather than demand constrained. And he said his overall position is you want that demand constrained position, not to the stage where you have a great depression with the inadequate demand in that sense, but to the stage where capitalists are competing with each other to get their share of aggregate demand, which will force, force more innovation on the economy. So <clears throat> that's, first of all, equilibrium itself is not necessarily a desirable state. Secondly, it's extremely unlikely to be the state the economy is in. And thirdly, as Jane Robinson once said, if you were in equilibrium, how would you know? Okay. So it's, it's just, it's an organising concept which has is, which is infested how economists think about the economy. It's not, it's not a desirable state in its own right. Uh, what is desirable is to avoid economic breakdown. And that was Minsky's point. Stability doesn't mean uh, equilibrium, it means avoiding breakdown of the economy. So with a complex system, the main defining feature of the system is not the accurate description of the individual entities inside it, but getting the relationships between them correctly specified. That's what gives you the behaviour. So things like water, for example, can't be explained unless you understand the interaction of different molecules with each other. Okay? You can't explain water from a single molecule of H2O. You have to be talking about how molecules of water interact with each other under different temperature conditions. And then you can explain water and steam and snow, etc., etc. But without the relationships, you can't do anything. Um, now, this, this uh, I think I've forgotten what this quote from, pardon me, I've forgotten the quote, Shackle. I should have known it was Shackle. Um, Shackle was, was one of the Keynes' companions, stroke critics to some extent who was, his main attack was on the whole idea of equilibrium as an essential concept. And apparently the, 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 the thing which he said to uh, the shackle but didn't write down, equilibrium is blither. Okay. Now that doesn't mean Keynes knew how to model in a non-equilibrium sense, but the vision of equilibrium as an organising system just didn't make, did, did, didn't make philosophical sense to Keynes, even though when it came to some of his mathematical reasoning, he worked that way because that was the set of tools he had at the time. So, equilibrium should be forgotten about as, a, as the idea of where things happen. It, it, things happen in a dynamic space where equilibrium is a tiny fraction of that overall dynamic space. So we need to understand how things behave out of equilibrium. And finally, economics is always an, everywhere a monetary phenomenon. You've got to understand money banks and debt to understand capitalism. If you don't do that, you're, you're modelling a, a you're modelling of tribal highlands, but you're not modelling the real world of capitalism. So those are my methodological principles. And that's why Graziani's work was so important, the whole idea about transactions being three-sided with one commodity and money being exchanged and a bank being an essential part of the process. So that's the different tradition that we are teaching you at Kingston. It's far less cohesive. Of course, there's many contributors to it. So some of the names that are the obvious in this room here, Goodwin and Minsky, are, uh, most people would be aware of Marx, Schumpeter, Veblen and Keynes. <coughs> Fisher, Goodwin and Minsky um, were more obscure in some, in some ways, but ultimately, of course, the, these days they've become dominant, Minsky in particular, and how we think. I've also should have mentioned Godley there. But that's, that's the sort of tradition we're looking at. Okay, do I mention Godley here? I don't. I better, I better do that straight away. Pardon me. And there goes my slide. But anyway, I'll get back to that. Hang on. I know what I can do. At least that'll work for a while. Okay. Now, what about an overall theory of value, though? That's shared ideas. What about a theory of value? Well. I won't take you through this one again, but looking back at the notes I gave you earlier on, on the Marxian vision, I think that's an organising principle. And if you look at what Marx was trying to do, uh, the, anybody here reading Marx or doing any work on Marx? There's a, a set of books by a guy called Alan Oakley. Um, I haven't mentioned them in the course, but Alan Oakley, O-A-K-L-E-Y, Australian philosopher. 
and economist, and he's done the best study on the making of Marx's capital. And what he argued was that Marx had six books in mind, and looking at what he actually wrote, in my opinion, Marx wrote one of the six books. Okay. He didn't go to the high, the next stage was going to be wage, labour and capital, which is, there's a pamphlet by that name, but Marx was, the first three volumes of capital, effectively were volumes of one book, where he assumed that workers got paid their uh, value. The next book was going to where they got paid more than their value. Okay. And then that was where the, 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 the you got a, a tiny glimpse of that in chapter 25 of volume one. But that, that to me was an organising structure that Marx was working towards. The labour theory of value stopped that all happening, unfortunately. Um, but I believe this particular foundation, which is consistent with uh, Whitehead's approach on philosophy as well, that can be a shared philosophical foundation from an orthodox economics. So you have a dialectical foundation in general, an objective basis for value in the first instance, income distribution turns up because of the conflict between workers and capitalists over sharing the surplus, effective demand turns up because you've got to turn those commodities into money, which you can't, you can, you can generate a physical surplus. Making that into a monetary surplus is another story again. And the money and banking system, of course, plays an essential role there. And you have the, the fact you've now got subjective valuation turning up. Subjective valuation turns up actually in effective demand as well, because what you produced might not be something which can actually be sold. Okay? And that's both at the individual level and the, and the collective level. Uh, in the monetary circuit area, the value of money is set by its expected, expected value, which means you've got subjective expectations about the future turning up there. And when you talk about new commodities, the prices people are willing to pay for new commodities, like this little toy, which I've now decided my sister is going to get as a birthday present, <laughs> given what she got given by her, the rest of her family, and she's raving about it, what a great present it was. So this is, one of these will be her present when I get back to Sydney in May. Um, you pay, you pay a, a subjective valuation for these commodities makes sense early on because they're not part of the means of production yet. Okay? Once they're incorporated, the cost level falls back to the other level. So you have a, a very complex vision of how it can integrate a whole of sets of different levels of thinking about capitalism. And what you get is a complex systems view. So here comes the $99 question, which nobody's ever properly answered, and I won't do it <coughs> properly either here. But I basically see it as any system which evolves over time. That's why it's often called a complex adaptive system. Um, <clears throat> any non-evolutionary system that has dependence upon initial conditions, which includes the weather. The weather is to some extent evolving given the pressures of climate change and human humanity's impact upon the planet. But you can largely treat that as a non-evolutionary system, but as subject to sensitive dependence upon initial conditions and what's called mixing. And I'll give a very simple explanation of that later. But the basic idea is all phase spaces, um, no, I can't say that, I can't say the interact, but um, as well as diverging from an initial starting point, you return very close to that initial starting point in very complex cycles. I'll show you a couple of examples of that. Now, the way it was discovered in the first instance is what's called the three body problem. Anybody heard of that? Okay, okay. And that is, when you look at Newton's equations for gravitational attraction, the inverse square law, that gives you a deterministic pattern for the orbit of a single planet around a single sun, or two suns orbiting around each other. Two, but it's limited to two objects. Uh, and what you'll get is an elliptical orbit. You can work out the two points of gravitational, well, if you, the circular motion that, that uh, Copernicus actually thought applied and that the Ptolemaics believed applied, does apply if you happen to start something orbiting around a sun uh, with its centre precisely on the centre of the sun itself. Now, if you throw a baseball at the sun, or let's say you throw a Tesla at the sun, okay, <laughs> it's going to orbit elliptically. Its shape will be an elliptical orbit because it's not perfectly centred on the sun when it's first projected in that direction. So you get an you elliptical orbit coming out of that. Now, the question that was posed back when Newton's equations were first understood is what about more than one planet? And in fact, the, 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 the king of France, I've forgotten which one it was, set up a prize of 100,000 francs. Now, we're talking serious money back when that prize was put forward. 100,000 francs to the first person to solve the three-body problem. And uh, it wasn't solved until 1899. 
and the person who solved it was a man called Henri Poincaré. Have you heard that name? One of the world's great, truly one of history's great mathematicians. And what he showed was there is no equation. Okay? You cannot get write down an equation which will describe deterministically the root of those different uh, bodies together. The orbits will be chaotic. And I've a little illustration um, which actually comes out of a... Um, a th I, this one was supposed to be linked to a simulation and I tried getting it working last night and would not run. So it might just be a single pitten. But what I've got here is two fixed suns and one planet. And that's the orbit of that planet and the suns in reaction to each other over time. But I do have a nice little simulation. I'll show you on the next slide. I know this one works. And we've, that was discovered in 1899, mathematically, using what's called a Poincaré section. Because uh, what Poincaré drew was effectively saying, well, I can't work out the equations straight away. But if you have three bodies, two, two planets orbiting the sun, then because they're orbiting, they're going to pass through a plane. If I draw a two-dimensional plane in this three-dimensional space, they will puncture that plane at various points. And working out the mathematics of that process, he worked out that there was infinite complexity in the sense that um, the, there would be no a, a totally aperiodic pattern of passing through those points. Again, I'd need to sit down and do a lot of reading to try to explain it well, and it's not essential to know that. But the idea was chaotic behave, behavior applied to the planets, and that was discovered in the 19, in uh, 1899, before the start of the last century. Now, since we got forgotten until Lorenz accidentally rediscovered it with his equations for fluid flow, but the basic dynamics start from having very sensitive dependence on initial conditions. So if you have a tiny difference between where you are and where you think you are, the knowledge you have of where you are decays exponentially over time. So after a finite period of time, you've essentially lost all information about what your position will be in the future, what was in the past. And I'll give you um, a nice example of that as well. And you can't approximate this with a linear model. The linear model will only make sense within very near, uh, very near to the equilibrium itself. And it will completely fail to describe the system properly. So nonlinear interactions dominate because <coughs> Equilibrium will be unstable, you'll be driven from the equilibrium, and then the divergence of two paths will become enormous over time. Um, and the linear components, which are the ones which would bring you back to equilibrium, are actually unstable. I'll give you a few examples of that. And the mixing idea, as I said, is you, you get moved far apart, come almost back together again. I'll give you another. I think I've got a, actually one I've managed to do by sheer accident. I've got a very nice simulation that I think I've, I can link in. Uh, in the lecture uh, today, I was giving a talk with a, a, uh, another group during the week, and I've managed to set my parameters up by sheer accident to get into quite an amazing divergence of two systems. Now, here's a classic, because the Apollo 12 rocket was, of course, one of the rockets that went to the moon. Of course, they abandoned the booster. Uh, the, well, the, I think really, I think it was a five-stage rocket, but one of the stages almost collided with the Earth and the moon in 2003. And when you look at the path of, the, of, the, of this rocket remnant, you can see just how chaotic things are. So let's just, it's, it's been going, let's, let's sort of go back to the beginning again. Can you see that clearly enough? Okay. Let's start it again. I've got it embedded over here. So this is showing the L1 point, the gravita equal gravitational point between the Earth and the Sun. There's the, there's the object coming in around the Lagrange point. Moon flicks it over, just misses Earth. Notice it's going inside the orbit of the Moon. Flung around again. And then finally, oh not this loop, that one, off it went to the rest of the solar system. Now when you talk about an, an asteroid just missing the Earth, they don't tell you just missing it five or ten times, do they? Okay? 
But that's the sort of dynamics which can occur, interaction of all those objects. <coughs> so that's complex behaviour, but it's not complicated. This is one of the mistakes that, um, that Hayek made when he equated complex systems with complicated in his um, Nobel Prize speech. He was right to talk about complex systems, but he thought complex meant complicated. Now, he wasn't to know because the mathematics was only worked out after his speech, but you can get complex behaviour out of very, very simple rules. And that's the essence with Lorenz's model of fluid flow turbulence because it only has three variables and three parameters. It's very hard to get a simpler model than this, so let's take a look at it in Minsky. So in terms of a set of equations, you have three parameters. This one, they've got beta, uh, rho, and sigma, 1, 15, and 5, uh, and three variables, the x variable, uh, the y variable, and the z variable. I'm starting them off at an equilibrium, and I can hit them with a shock to show what happens. But that's saying the rate of change of x is sigma, which is a constant, times y minus x. That looks like a really simple equation, doesn't it? dy is rho minus z multiplied by x minus y. Again, very simple. And dz, which is the temperature gradient, is y times x minus b times z. It'd be pretty hard to imagine a simpler system than that. And well, that's what amazed um, Lorenz when he simulated it, because this was its behaviour. Equilibrium, isn't it exciting? Let's hit it with a shock. Shock has now gone to zero. Now, because I put it started so close to the equilibrium, that's why it's taking so long to diverge from that one. But you can see um, there's some sort of attractor in there. And neoclassicals might expect it to converge to that attractor. In fact, it's slowly, slowly, slowly diverging. I think we've got some speed problems with the latest version of Minsky. That's very slow. And I've got to let it run for a bit longer so you see what I'm talking about. Ah. Sorry about it being so slow. Ah. There's what's called a runge cutter algorithm running behind this to actually simulate the location of the object. And clearly it's taking too small a step size. That might be related to the fact that I've got it so close to equilibrium. Let's wait and see. What I might do, just to cheat, the shutter down so it's not doing any screen updating for a while, and then come back. Yeah, we've got a few more. Okay, let's keep on going. It's the screen updating. It's good. I'll come back in a couple of seconds to that. Ultimately, it's going to draw that shape, okay? which is where the idea of the butterfly pattern came from. So you have an equilibrium here, which it never converges to, an equilibrium here, which it never converges to, Another one down here, which it never converges to. Or zero is in the middle there, pardon me. Let's go back and see what it's doing. I'll come back and keep on looking at that. I'm so sorry it's taking so long. So there's many, many technical issues in explaining it. And again, an introductory course would take a year to get through, which we don't have. And you'd need to have done algebra, calculus, and differential equations before you did the introductory course. So it's not exactly easy. There is a brilliant overview on that free book called chaosbook.org. I'll just bring it up and show you. Show you. Okay. So they had an open course in it, but that's, that's obviously over now. But uh, it's very nicely linked book on the entire, pretty much the entire knowledge we have of complex systems in that one very, very large book. I think it's about a, if you printed it out, it's in the order of about a thousand pages. But that will give you a complete background, the idea of complex systems. Let's see what's happening with, uh, still going around that equilibrium. Okay. <coughs> but the basic insight, it's simple systems give you complex behavior, so long as there are nonlinear interactions between them. So the essential components, you have to have non-additive relationships go beyond adding things together. Of course, if you look at what you do in econometrics, you're always adding Alpha is beta 1 times x plus beta 1, 2 times y, etc., etc., um, with, without having multiplication of variables by each other. But something multiplicative 
division, something of that nature, some nonlinear interaction will give you the essence of a complex system. The other is the number of dimensions, and this is another classic paper in the literature called Period 3 Implies Chaos. Ah, looks like I've lost, I've got the out of date link there. Somebody's taken the paper down. Okay, I'll have to link that in later. I'll put that on with the slides on, on Patreon later. But you need three dimensions. So you look at the, the good, the, the um, Lorenz model over here, which is so slow. Uh, there are three dimensions there, the X, the Y, and the Z dimension. You won't get complex behavior with just two dimensions in continuous time. You have to have three. I'll just jump back up. That's really annoying. I haven't actually run that one for a while. Ah, hang on. Okay, now it's finally doing it. Okay, so it's now blasted away from that one equilibrium and it's now rotating around the other. That's still incredibly slow. I'm not quite certain why. I'm going to show that to Russell and see if you can work out why that's so slow. Anyway, I'll let that continue running. Uh, and the, this is partly because you can't get mixing in 2D two dimensional models because fundamentally, you, in any dynamic system, any particular solution from a particular set of initial conditions will not intersect with any other solution. Okay. It's like you're drawing concentric circles. You can't have them overlap and cut each other. So with a two-dimensional system, you, the way you can think about it is imagine you've got your finger on, on the tabletop and you're trying to move the finger in such a way that it never cuts over the same point. We well, really have only three options. You either cycle in towards the equilibrium, you explode away from it, or you cycle towards the limit cycle. Okay? For me, the outside or inside, getting finer and finer every time. That's the best you can do. So you can't mix the orbits together. Now, the three-dimensional analogy of that is a box. And what you've got to do now is put your hand in a box and move it around in the box so that the point, point never intersects with the line you're drawing. Can you do that? You can do anything you like, okay? So the three-dimensional side is essential to get that uh, phenomenon of mixing. So that's that's the major difference between the two systems. You won't see it in two-dimensional systems. It has to be third-order, non-linear. That's the bottom line. Now, here's a couple of few two-dimensional systems. That's one which starts near the equilibrium, diverges but goes to a limit cycle. This one is coming in from the outside. This is showing the phase space dynamics of the same system. If you start in equilibrium, you get pushed, pushed away. If you start outside, you get pushed towards the, the limit cycle. But otherwise, you tend to spend your entire time orbiting towards that route. That's the three-dimensional version you're seeing for Lorenz. So what I'm showing you there is just a two-dimensional graph. But it's actually a three-dimensional object. You have the x location of a drop of water, effectively, the y location, and the temperature gradient. And so it's it also, one thing you can say, but is it filling the entire box? Not is it, okay? This is another thing about a chaotic system versus a stochastic one. If you had a stochastic process, every point in the box would be visited at some point. There would be different intensities how often it happened, but the whole box would be available for you. So in that sense, you filled the entire phase space, and that's one definition of an ergodic system, predictable in its own way. This is a non-ergodic system, which is deterministic. And that's one thing a lot of post keynesians who haven't done enough mathematics can't get their heads around. You can have a deterministic system whose future cannot be predicted. And the statistical average of the past does not tell you what's going to happen in the future. Okay. So, anyway, with those three-dimensional models, you can get complexity. And there are two broad approaches to modeling. One is multi-agent. Um, and there you get, you might have you define a, a thousand agents or even, even a handful of agents is enough. But you get interaction of individual agents and you therefore try to get the, the aggregate level coming out of it. Now, classically, you could model water that way. You could make up a multi-agent simulation of water molecules interacting with each other, have a thousand of them, all defined exactly the same way, then define how they each, each, each individual uh, molecule interacts with others which are in its neighborhood and then change the temperature which would be the background setting for the for the uh, 
the room temperature or the outside temperature and so on and see what what shape what what types of behavior evolve some will be fluid flow other steam ice etc etc uh, so your model would be multiple uh, molecules in close proximity to each other and that's of course an economic theory you find seeing people doing lots of multi-agent work now multi-agent modeling in R in net logo etc etc you define what a worker is you define what a capitalist is you define what a good is you define transactions between each agent etc etc you then simulate and see the behavior what I prefer doing is top-down model you get the you model the structure of the economy as a whole at the aggregate level and if you look at what Lorenz did he started working what are called the Navier Stokes equations which are still unsolved equations to describe fluid dynamics but they're incredibly complicated. I think they're about 11 dimensional. There's a huge level of dimensionality. They're partial differential equations. He stripped them down to three first order um, nonlinear differential equations. Very laborious process, effectively a Taylor series. Um, I prefer to go to the top down for a number of reasons. One is that that's what most sciences do anyway. They start with the top down type modeling. Only when they get to the absolute boundary of what they can do with that do you start seeing multi-agent type simulations occurring and uh, and you can derive it from the actual nature of the system in the aggregate so the original equations for uh, thermodynamics had an aggregate idea of an equi equilibrium of a volume okay? and then now we know they've got to do work about the the boundaries of that volume to properly describe non-equilibrium thermodynamics but that's the same idea that you start from the actual system and work down from its aggregate behavior. Now, how to do that for the economy itself? Uh, well, this is one reason why the, post, the neoclassicals have a point when they're critical of post-Keynesians, because they say, look, you guys are all ad hoc. You grab a model from anywhere. There's no structure to what you're doing. Well, I think uh, we can have the, the dialectical objectivism as a way of, of handling the fact that everything depends on everything else, but you're still understanding which layer to start at to build an overall model. Um, and it can be realistic. These, these are some of the elements that are part of post-Keynesian thinking. You have to acknowledge that we have an uncertain future. So the idea of optimizing goes out the window because how can you optimize when the future is uncertain? Okay. Stock flow consistency is essential. You can't leave out the um, you, neoclassical see general equilibrium is giving them stock flow consistency. What's really meant by the post Keynesians is tracking where everything goes, including money, which of course neoclassicals leave out. And also, though it's not often done, the fact that production is uh, production is a multi commodity activity. You don't just produce corn. You have to have multiple inputs to produce outputs, which we. In a, there have been a few attempts to do that by post-Keynesians at an aggregate level, but that's still, I think, something to be <coughs> to be um, achieved rather than a completed piece of work. But to me, the ultimate realism comes out of the macroeconomic identities, and I want to show you how you can turn that into a basic dynamic model, which gives you the dynamics of the economy from its very structure. You don't need to go back to micro to derive it. <coughs> Pardon me. I'm just checking my time. Okay. Um, so my starting point is Marx's dialectics to explain where surplus comes from, which as I said is not labor, it's energy and exergy. The second one Marx spoke about was the struggle between workers and capitalists over the distribution of income. And that's one which, was, which of course has been done by, by um, Richard Goodwin. So if you look at, has anybody here read Capital? Okay. Uh, I know it's ages since I read the whole thing. But the most remarkable thing for me is this chapter 25 model. It comes out of nowhere. Marx is making a general critique of Smith, and then he starts talking about cycles occurring because of a rise in the price of labor. Now, in most of volume one, he's assuming workers get paid their value, meaning a subsistence wage. Suddenly he starts talking about the price of labor changing. It really is quite a out of the blue comment. And he says accumulation will slacken because the rise in the price of labor blunts the stimulus of gain. In other words, rising wages means falling profit in the two-class system he's thinking in terms of. The rate of accumulation lessens. Capitalists are investing less, less accumulation of capital, less need to hire workers. And then as because of that change, um, 
workers get to be unemployed, wages will fall, and the price of labour falls again. And all of this, whether the level be below the same as or above the one was normal before the rise in wages took place. So he's not talking about returning to an equilibrium level or to a subsistence level or to the value of labour power. This wonderful finishing sentence, to put it mathematically, the rate of accumulation is the independent variable, the rate of wages is the dependent variable. So wages that are, are, the wage rate is a product of the rate of accumulation of capital, not the other way around. Okay. Now, that ends up being correct mathematically. Marx never managed to do it properly, but it does give you an explanation for this wage and profit cycle. So you start with the idea of a capitalist society. You're looking at labour. At the foreground side of the labour is it's a commodity which is paid a subsistence wage. The background is it's not a commodity. Okay? It'll, apples don't go on strike. Workers don't go on strike enough these days either. But the capacity to organise is something which is specifically human. You're demanding a share in the surplus. So the dialectical outcome of that is the value of, will be the minimum wage, not the actual wage. And income distribution dynamic will be a major part of what happens in capitalism. And that was in Marx's own logic. Um, so you get a struggle over the distribution of surplus. And th th there are seven occasions in which Marx talks about the value of labour power and the wage. In every last one, he says the value of labour power alias the minimum wage. Okay? So he doesn't see workers getting their value. He sees them getting more than their value, but the extent to which they get that depends upon um, the level of employment and so on. So you get economic cycles given by a struggle over the distribution of income. Now Richard Goodwin saw a similar idea here. He was studying with the French mathematician who was the leading person on predator prey systems at the time. And he saw the same basic idea going on here, that you had a, you had a large number of fish, there'd be a rapid growth in the shark population, lots of fish for sharks to eat. Because the shark population grows, more fish get eaten. This is going to be falling numbers of fish, which means sharks die off. And because the sharks die off, more fish can live to breed, which means more sharks can come back again. So you've got a cyclical behaviour coming out of that. Now, Marx's logic is very similar. Capital determines the level of output. So your level of production depends upon installed uh, machinery base. Output determines how many workers you need to employ. Employment determines the rate of change of wages, Phillips curve type argument. Wages determine profits, and in the simple model that Goodman put together and that Marx had in mind in that extract, profit determines investment, and investment is the rate of change of the capital stock. So you've got two rates of change turning up in the system overall, and you get cyclical growth out of that as Marx thought you would. So the simplest form here is to have linear relationship between the variables. You know that you don't need nonlinear behavioural functions to get nonlinear behaviour. The nonlinear behaviour comes out of the structure of the model, which involves a couple of essential nonlinearities. Wages times labour being the essential one in this model. So you have capital determines output. You say k divided by a uh, accelerator relationship gives you the level of output y. Output determines employment becomes divide output by labour productivity you work out how many workers you have to hire. And that's given the population rate, gives you an employment rate. The employment rate determines the rate of change of wages, and I've got WR for real wages there. So that's a simple differential equation. The rate of change of wages is some function of the employment rate. And a simple linear function will do. So that's your Phillips curve, rate of change of wages. That's some function of the employment rate. Uh, and the simple I simply use a, a linear one saying that the that wage change function has the actual employment rate minus the level where wages don't rise or fall multiplied by the slope of workers' reaction at that stage. Now, if, you know, if employment's 1% above equilibrium for what the wage setting here, how much of a wage demand will workers, to, workers demand? That's factored by that particular constant there. So it's quite a simple model. So there's your... Um, rate where wage change is zero, that's the slope of the workers' reaction function, and that's the actual employment rate. Now then you get the wage rate times labour gives you the wage bill, and that's your essential nonlinearity in this model. You're multiplying two variables together. That's a semi-quadratic in that sense. And output minus the wage bill determines profit, so profit minus output minus wages is profit. 
And then with all profits being invested, investment is equal to profits. And what Gubin actually left out in his own model, but I included and it tended to be much more important uh, than I thought it would be, is the role of depreciation. So investment minus depreciation equals the rate of change of capital stock. And that gives you the overall model. Now, put that together in Minsky. Who's, who's got a copy of Minsky? Who's got a, again, I should have told you to bring your laptops again. I, a few laptops with Minsky installed. Uh, there's a new version. Have you got the latest version yet? 2.4? Okay, download it. Because a couple of important bugs have been fixed up there. Yeah. Yeah. So bring up 2.4. Boy, that's slow. Incredibly slow. I'll stop it at that point and pass it on to Russell later. Pardon? I don't know. It might be uh, not quite certain why it's so slow. I'll make sure I've got the right version. Have I got version 2.4? Let's see. Yep, 2.4. Anyway, let's find out. So this is a bit of a ray that uh, I gave to, I think I've already covered this with you in other, other talks, but you know, you, you know how to use Minsky already. So this is a bit of repetition here from a, a previous set of slides I haven't properly edited yet. Um, the whole idea of using a flow chart. So when you look at what I've just given you a moment ago, it is actually a flow chart for building a Gutner model. So what I'm going to do now is get you to do that. Uh, but let's just get, get, it, get it installed. We'll take a break and then come back and we'll try to build the Goodman model in Minsky and get that right. Okay? Mm -hmm. All right. So we start from a basic equation saying capital divided by a uh, capital output ratio is, 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 is the output. Let's give that a try in Minsky. So you want a variable called k. I was going to type k onto the keyboard there. And I'm not going to give it any value. Um, you, you could if you like, but I'm just going to give it k as a value. Let's zoom in a bit so you can see a bit more clearly. Divided by V, now V is the capital output ratio, and that normally is seen as having a value of about uh, 3. Well, let's give it a value, say, initially of 3, with a range of between 2 and 4, with a step size of 0 0.01. So that's what I've defined there on the parameter. So it's a parameter. Notice the initial value by this is nothing shown there. I just typed two a moment ago. This is one of the hassles of Minsky. That where the if you can see as I move the cursor up and down, the focus changes. This is a Linux standard, and I can't talk Russell out of it, so I'm stuck with this particular standard that I don't like. But now I can type two there. We've got an initial value of two. Maximum value of oh hey, that's what I'm doing. Maximum two, minimum of four. Pardon me. Let's go the other way around. Maximum of four, minimum of two. No wonder I was getting problems. Okay. And there's your step size. So that's so we can change V and see what happens dynamically when we run the program. Now, when you when you define something as a parameter, its color changes to blue, as you can see there. Okay. So you've got capital and uh, the capital output ratio. Oh, by the way, notice this square cursor thing. As soon as I press the shift key, that goes to back to the pointer again. So that's a little solve to get around that problem. I want to divide them, type a divide by key, drag from the K node to the top of the multiply, the divide by block, the V to the bottom, and define that as Y. Don't give that a value, just choose OK. There's that keyboard changing again, or the mouse changing. So now what you've defined is a simple equation, which is over here. Once you've defined that as an equation of alternative, so y is equal to k divided by v. So you got that? Okay. Now, can anybody see that I'm making a sort of making a mistake here? Capital is an integral block. I haven't included that yet, but I've done that deliberately because Minsky does give you the option with a right click to add an integral to a variable. I'll show you that a little bit there. One of your options is add integral. And I haven't tried this before. This could bomb, but it's worth a try to see how Minsky behaves. So just to find it, k divided by v is y. Uh, your next stage is to say, well, that's output. How many workers do you need to hire? 
using A for labour productivity. I'll make that another parameter. Value of one will do for a starting point. So give a, but again, I'll just leave it at that level. Um, I don't want to have negative labour productivity there, so let's make a minimum of, say, 0 0.1. Another divide by key, so divide output by labour productivity, you get how many workers you need to hire, which is L. And just click on the OK button not to you don't need to define it. There's that square cursor again. Press the shift key, it'll disappear. So that's your employment rate. All got that? Now, employment, level of employment, you want to work at the employment rate, so you divide by population. I use N for population. You can use pretty much whatever you like, but I'll make that uh, N. I'll give it a value of 100 to begin with and uh, make that a um, make it a parameter or not. All the, this stuff is all supposed to be variable in Minsky, so, but I'll, I'll, I'll make it a parameter first of all and give it a range. Uh, and that's notice you can be typing here. Like if I'm trying to type 200 here, and if I continue typing, the focus goes to where the cursor is. So be very careful of where your cursor is. This is just a idiosyncrasy of um, of Linux that's part of the system because that's the way that Russell defines. So I've got say value of 200 there for population. Again, there's that square cursor. That's that's for grabbing and moving stuff around. Uh, it gets in the way of seeing where you're actually pointing. So if you press the shift key, you'll get rid of it. So there's L. So divide that by N. You've now got the employment rate. And the symbol I use for the employment rate, which is taken from, which makes sense, it's this lowercase Greek letter, lambda. Type the backslash key. Type L-A-M-B-D-A. Press enter. And you'll get the Greek letter lambda on the screen there. So now I've got the employment rate. Am I going too fast or too slow? A little bit faster. A little bit fast. Okay, so get to the stage you've got lambda there. So that's your employment rate. If you check the equations over here, those are your equations, all definitions so far. And that's partly the point. We're working from definitions to build a macro model. Very, very simple definitions. So that's the employment rate. Now what I want to do is say, well, let's take the gap between this and the level at which workers don't want wage demands. And my symbol for doing that is lambda, again, underscore z for zero, indicating zero change to wages when you're at this level of employment. And I'll give that a value of 0 0.6 and make that into a parameter. Say a maximum of 0 0.7 and a minimum of 0 0.5. So you can just change these values during a simulation. The step size is 0 0.01. So if employment is 60% of the population, which is roughly the level it tends to be between 60 and 65%. Not the, I'm not using unemployment rate because it's, it, it becomes too unstable at the unemployment rate. Because you're right, if you, if you work at the unemployment rate of say 5% or 4% is your stable point, you're only a tiny distance from where you're going to have 100% employment. Okay, but in the real world, we know that about 60% of the population gets a job. So I'm working with the population rate, not the unemployment rate. And if I subtract uh, the actual level of employment from the um, from the uh, zero wage change level, I've got the gap between employment and the level where wages don't change. So you want to multiply that by something that tells you what's workers reaction function to to that uh, level of uh, employment. I'll go to lambda under, uh, underscore capital S and say give that a value just, just for the sake of it. It's a high value of 10, making that into another parameter. Say maximum of 20, minimum of one, step size of one. And if I multiply that together, Then I can call this the wage change function. So I'll just go W, WC for wage change, underscore curly brackets, 
fn for function. The reason we're doing it that way is you can actually attach something else to it at a later stage to make it into a nonlinear one if you want to, which we'll have a crack at next week quite possibly. So there's the wage change function. Then you multiply that uh, by the current wage to get the rate of change of wages. Your Phillips curve relationship. So I've got it in here. Let's see. Okay. You've got a rate of change of the wheel. I've got, I'm showing WR for real wage there. Um, the, this, this is effectively, if you, if, you, if you multiply through by the, or divide through by the wage rate, you get the rate of change, the percentage rate of change of wages is the employment function. So in terms of a dynamic model of that, you want to have the, the wage change function multiplied by the wage rate gives you the rate of change of wages. So at this point, you need, it's, I'll, I'll use W underscore R there. I'm going to cheat here. I'm not going to show you to test something out. W underscore R for the real wage. I'm not going to give the value straight away. Right click and notice one opportunity there is add integral. Because this should be an integral block. It shouldn't be, it's not a constant. It's something which is, we've got a rate of change of wages. So the way you show that in a dynamic model is you have an integral block for it. Add integral. And now there's an integral block coming in. And there are two elements to that integral block. If you wire this up to the top, that is giving you the wage change function as the input to the block. Down here, you can give an initial value for the wage. So I'm going to type another, have another parameter, which I'll call w underscore zero for the initial wage. You give that a value of say one, make that into a parameter. And say so maximum of two, minimum of, of 0 0.1, Give it a step size. And you can feed that into the bottom of the integral block. So that's your initial condition. Okay? That's a new feature in Minsky. We're still, I'm sure there's going to be problems with it, but it means you can actually, you can make your initial conditions into an integral block, a variable, which is useful for testing out a range of parameter uh, values. And you see it explicitly rather than having to, as before, if you wanted to do that, you have to right click here, choose edit and then change the initial value on this little screen here, which is just clumsy. I'd rather have all the stuff explicitly stated here. That's your wage rate. Now, what's the next step? We've got to that point. What else do I need to define? Huh? Uh, yeah, but what's profit net of? It's output minus Wages, total wages. How do I get total wages there? Times labour. Yeah, because yeah. you already—that's the reason I've stopped at this point. Is that once you've got that, that's all you need to know to get the rest of the model written almost <coughs> writing itself. Because you have labour here, you have the wage rate there, you have output here, okay, and you've got capital, okay. Those are all the elements you need. So once you've got that much defined, you're on the way to defining a full Goodwin model. So let's now say, let's take a copy of the labor. So right click here and choose copy. Copy that there, multiply labor by the real wage, which we're working with a, 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 a non-price system at the moment. That is your wage bill. So capital W for wages. Wire that up, you've got the wage bill, right? Now you want to work out profit, what's profit? Yep, just grab hold of Y, copy that, output minus wages, take a minus block, whoops, and that's all I'm going to do, I'm going to backslash capital pi for that variable. So there's profit. Now, in the simple Goodwin model, Goodwin had all profits being invested. But I want to include, actually, I'll leave, I'll leave depreciation out. We'll add that at a later stage. So I can now say that profit is investment. So I'll type capital I, and that's giving another variable down here. Now, one thing, you, you normally loop these things back. I don't actually have to loop it. I could have it a straight line, but it's nice to illustrate that. So one option you have in right-clicking is flip, which flips the direction around. And now if I wire from pi to I, I'm now saying all profit is invested. And now if I wire, what I want to do here 
and this, I'm doing a, making a deliberate mistake here, by the way, because some of you did this when trying to build the predator prey model earlier. If I now drag this up to K and I try run, okay, notice the message you get maximum order recursion reach. Anybody get that when they're trying to build a model? Yep, I know. <laughs> okay, the reason is. You've got an algebraic relationship and you're supposed to have a differential equation rate. Investment is the rate of change of capital. So what I need to do, I'm just going to delete that uh, line. When the blue dot's on there, I can press the delete key and get rid of it. And I want to right click and add an integral to the K block. Now I've got an integral there. I need to give an initial value. Let's say the initial, uh, let's say K0, so K underscore zero. And I'll give that a, let's say, let's say value of 300 uh, and a range between, say, 400 and 100 with a step size of 1. And make that into a parameter as well. Notice it's now pointing the wrong way. Because once, once you've flipped in one direction, Minsky continues putting the next set of objects in the same orientation. So I'll flip it around the other way. Attach that to the bottom of the integral sign for capital and now I can attach investment to the top I'll just save that always save frequently the Minsky because as I said there are bugs in every software package and Minsky's got a lot um, hang on so I call this good one basic One, okay. Now just get that. When you click on the, once you see the blue dot highlighted, you click and drag on the blue the right. You can drag the line into a curve. And once you come close to the line, you'll see these other little blue dots turn up. Clicking on one of those lets you change the loop somewhat. So that's just to make it make the, the causality more obvious. Again, I'll just click that little blue dot there and drag it past the initial condition. Ah. Okay, click on a graph and bring it down. Let's graph the employment rate. Take a copy of that, attach that to say the black input. And let's take a copy of the wage rate, attach that to the red input, save it and click and see if it runs. And it doesn't, yes it does, there you go. So what you've got is a basic dynamic model. So who's got to that stage? Cool. No? Now it's a lot more work for Goodwin to design this for the very first time, but that's the essence of the Goodwin model. And what you get, of course, is cyclical behaviour. Let's play around with a few more features of the Minsky interface here. So I'm going to delete the WR on that side because there's no point scaling the wage rate and the employment rate to the same level. Oh, damn! <laughs> it deleted the wrong thing, that's great. Okay, so delete that Y, which is what I wanted to do. Oh dear, hang on a second, I'll come take a look. Let's go back and drag this line around a bit. So I'll just finish it. So I flip this around, graph this on the other side, and now let's see, I should get two graphs which are much more scaled to each other. Okay, so what's gone wrong there? Uh, what have you got? Yep, and serves you done wrong. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, they're not diverging, they're fine. Yep, you've got it. Yeah, you got it right, okay. So have you all got working models there for those who've got a computer in front of them? I might just cover a couple of nice features of the Minsky interface before you before we start going deeper into the, the modeling side of things as well. So that charts a bit on the messy side. Uh, if you right click you can change um, 
let's see, options let you put things like titles inside there. So I can call this uh, employment, hang on, i spell that correctly, and wages, and layer one side, employment, and the other wages. Ah, that's years, pardon me. I'm going to actually see, I don't know whether Minsky supports this yet, but I'll type in Lambda as a value then see if it actually does that properly and uh, wages, a wage rate. Let's see if it actually handles that. No, it doesn't. It doesn't actually give you the, the label properly. So I'll just, call that, I'll just go back and rename that to be the wage group, let's see, or the uh, employment rate. We've still got a long way to go before the graphs are... Uh, sexy enough for my liking, but anyway, that's a start. Now, let's just make that a bit larger. Whoa! Why did that... That's... Okay, let's, I've got to straighten that. If they, you get a messy line like that, one option is straighten it. I don't know why that changed. Then again, it's another bug, I imagine. I'm just going to see if I can drag that dot out of the way. Actually, that that's so messy that I'm just going to cheat here. I'm going to delete that wire going across there, take a copy of I, whack it up here, <coughs> flip it around, and attach I there. And I don't need to have that complicated. That, that's, that's showing a causal loop. I'll just flip this back around the other way and straighten that wire. So that's your entire causal process. You're going from I to I over here. Okay. So... I, I like showing the loop overall to show the total dynamics, but that was just easier to do it that way. Now, notice up in the top window here, you've got the number of time cycles. This is currently 31 years worth of simulation. If you run incessantly, you get it all jams together because the default start of the t-axis is zero. And the default here is the end of the simulation. But you can actually bring t if you notice the second last icon up there on the top row is T for time. Click on T and feed that into the angle input on that axis. Notice as well as the four horizontally aligned ones, there's one angle aligned at an angle on the top and bottom of each axis. Well, that lets you set the axis bound. So it's saying that the x axis, the, the, the bottom of the x axis here is t. I can have t minus 20 at the other end. So I'll take a copy of t, have a constant, say 20 for 20 years worth of cycles. And t minus 20. and feed that into the other end, the far end of the x-axis. And simulate that. Oh, I've done something wrong. What did I do wrong? Let's see. That should have worked, I thought. Hang on. That may be another bug. I'm not sure. Ah. Got the help system by accident. What have I done wrong? Let's see in terms of wiring that. Ah. That should be right. It should have given me a little um, sliding window. I don't know why I'm not actually getting that. T minus 20. Should be okay. Let's try it again. Not graphing it. Okay, I'm going to delete. I'm not, not sure why that's happening. That could be another bug. I'll select those wires and now run it again. Let's see what happens. Okay, so let's try that again. Off to the angle there. Looks like I've discovered another bug. I don't know why it's doing that. It worked on it works in other versions. I've lost the graph. Not sure why. So much for showing a nice version of a feature of Minsky. I found it, may have found it you another another bug instead. So, oops. Let's try T minus 20 at that. Let's see if that alone works on its own. No, I think it's going to crash the program, but it looks at this. Let's say, yes, it's crashed. Okay. So, so there are bugs.
I'll bring that back up again. I think I saved it before I made that mistake. Let's see. Recent files. Oh dear. Okay, let's see if I've actually got it on the... Um, basically, I've got it there. What stage did I get to? Okay. All the stuff I just tried to do, I've lost. I might just try again and see if I can get that T, T here. I got the same bug. Same bug? Yeah. Well, okay. It worked the first time and then I hit restart, basically. Not going to... Crash that one. That's working okay. I'll make it T minus 20, let's see. Right click and flip. I'll make a, I'll make a parameter. I'll, I'll, I'll not go for a constant again and see if that reproduces the error. Let's say 20. So I get a 20 year window. T minus 20. I'm not sure where that bug. That should have worked because it certainly worked in previous versions. That's still working there. Now I try to click and run. Oh, all right. I've got a bug. I've got a bug for me, for Russell to track down there. I'd say. So I'll just have to get rid of the attempting. But what with that? What that's supposed to do is give you a range over with the program display. So you see a 20-year sliding window there. Um, I don't know what's going on. I'll, I'll, I'll find. Ah, I'll find out the hardware. What's actually gone wrong there? And I have I up here, but I have a few little bugs turning up by the looks of it. So take a copy of I, flip it around. Now it's come back again. Okay. I didn't mean to say so many bugs in one go, but I certainly have. So I'm not quite certain what's causing that. I'll try one else. I'll save it, the current state. Now that's actually to the wrong. Oh, hang on. That might be it. Maybe I might wire the wrong one up. They're very close together. The little black angle one there and the black angle one there. That's correct. It disappears. If I delete the wires. It reappears. So. I found a bug. Great. I'll track it down later. But that is a sliding window, so you can take a small range and see what the phase dynamics look like. That's what I was trying to illustrate because there are no time lags in this system. Okay. And people often think to get cyclical behavior, you've got to have time lags. You've got to be able to differencing stuff and so on. If you take a look at what's actually happening in there, this one is still heading down. Actually, I'll put it on the other side so it's more obvious. I'm going to delete that, drag it over here, flip it around, wire that to the pink, make this bit larger. Let's actually take a look at it on a large scale. It's a bit too large. Ah, oh, now again, that's this might be not handling with the resolution of my screen. You notice that's actually larger. Then I'm letting go for that'll that'll have to do. I had a resizing bug with Minsky yeah? on the last one. Yeah, I Same. resized a godly table and then I can't go into the godly table and come out and it okay. sort of became gigantic. Okay. Now what you get is a phase difference between the two things, between the two systems without time lags. And phase differences are a common thing in a dynamic system. There's nothing unusual about that. But economists often think if things have a different frequency, one must be a lag function of the other. Okay? It's not a lag. In the same way, sine and cosine are not lagged versions of each other, but they're intimately related to each other. So you can see the cyclical behavior there. Let's also put together a, uh, uh, a proper phase plot diagram. And if you wire one input, take a copy of lambda, wire that to the, let's say, wire that to the red input. Then if you wire the wage rate to the same colored input on the bottom axis, you get an XY plot. Okay? So have you all got that done? I'm sorry about the sliding window not working. I really want to. That's one of my, my nice features. I'm not quite certain what's gone wrong there. Russell will know. 
but something that happens when that gets tagged together. So back over to the lecture itself, what you've got is a causal loop and you have to go through a rate of change to make that work. Okay? If you don't put a rate of change inside there, you'll, you'll get the program saying too many levels of recursion, meaning you're trying to define an algebraic relationship as a dynamic one. And uh, all I've shown you, therefore, with Minsky, is stuff you can do with any other program in the industry. Pardon, what have you got? Okay, let's see. Jamie. Jamie. How not save? You want to save as different name. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay. Any other bugs? Yours is working? Well, I haven't done it before, so I'm just watching. Oh, okay, yeah, that's fair enough, yeah. So the main thing of this, I've already shown you Minsky's main feature, which is being able to do the monetary modeling on top, but that's pretty much what you can do with any of these programs at all. So I've done a model of good ones. Um, basic model there. This is all just showing you stuff we've already gone through the toolkit. Uh, originally, you, you had to click on the toolbar, but I always wanted to be able to put the objects directly onto the canvas. That's something which is unique to Minsky still, and this is an industry space. <coughs> Simulation controls also, one thing we haven't made great use of, is record controls. And what they are, and we're still <coughs> fine-tuning this, it's going out there, you can record the building of a building of a model. That's as a teaching tool for me, ultimately. So I could actually record building a model and then replay it step by step. That's the idea of that. So if you want to give it a play and see if you can actually, hang on, yeah, record a simulation and replay it being done later, that records the script, including the drawing of arrows and so on, so on for the program. And of course, changing the simulation speed over here. Okay, hang on, I'm typing a variable down there by accident, I'll just cancel that. And change the simulation speed and so on. Now the beauty of that, this is, this is actually a model you can derive from definitions and I'll show you that in a second. But it gives you cyclical non-equilibrium behavior very first model, which is rather different to the neoclassical starting point of believing everything happens in equilibrium. So go past all that. We've done enough of that so far. And of course, you had to go through variables of typing on the window. Okay. Just some later improvements that we've done just recently. That's the recording, as I mentioned a moment ago. Uh, that is a panopticon. The idea of that is that with a, the actual design space for this is 100,000 pixels by 100,000 pixels. This screen is 2,000 by 4,000. So you know, there's room for about 50 or 100 more screens. The idea is to be able to have a wraparound environment. Ultimately, there are some of those in computing facilities around the world. And I'm going to have multiple inputs as well, so politicians can be told, you think you know how to run the economy, go and give your ideas a try, see what happens on the simulated version before you do it to the real one. So that's part of the design phase there. But the panopticon idea is you could actually work out, I'm up here, I'm going to move down here, then you, this is still to be implemented as yet, but you could click here and move to wherever you were, put an object and see where all the objects are on a large screen without losing track of everything. It's still a feature in progress, but that's the idea there. Um, also, one thing I haven't explained yet, well, we might do a bit of this in the next couple of weeks, is there's a range of logical operators here, including a switch function. I'll bring that down. I won't work on it right now. But the switch, is it's, it's a case function. And at the moment, there are two possible inputs. You have a logical situation that comes in the top, uh, and an either or that can be executed and the, the straight line shows you which one is being executed at the time, and that's dynamic during a simulation. So if I right click, I can add an extra case, and I can have three possible inputs. And the program will then point to the one which is actually active. 
with that straight line. So, and then there are, look up here, you can see ones for uh, OR operators, so you can have a couple of conditions applied together. So, for example, if you're talking, working in a, in a real, in a, in a nominal um, model of the economy, you don't want to have negative nominal interest rates. I mean, I know they apply in Switzerland, but you want to make sure they remain positive in your model. So you have an if you switch there, the rate is either zero or more than if you're creating it by adding together two variables. And that can happen if you have a, um, um, a central, you want to model the central bank behavior setting the base rate, um, some reaction to inflation setting the variable rate, and make sure if you have deflation, you don't have banks giving you a discount. Okay? Banks, you, do, you remodel banks as not, not giving you a negative rate of interest if the inflation rate is negative. That's what you use those sort of switches for. Yeah. How do the equations work for them? With a switch? Yeah. Well, it's a, the simulation is it's, it's it's a stepwise simulation. So you're doing a you're doing a you're approximating the actual model. There's what's called the beta shattering hypothesis to show that that's valid for a complex nonlinear model. But at each step point, the program reevaluates what are the current values. Now, if you've gone through a point where the switch suddenly applies, uh, you go from one simulation to the next, it'll click over to the switch value. But is that <coughs> if you were to export the equations? It comes up as, it uses the Kronecker delta. You did ask. That's what it gives you. I've actually, if I, if I put it in here, I get a Kronecker delta function. Okay, so the, you know, under some conditions, one, eight, otherwise zero. So it's actually expressed with a series of multiplied by ones and multiplied by zeros minus a value, which can go to one. So the first statement is, it actually makes it very hard to read. Yeah, I thought that was... Yeah, it's a mess, okay. okay. Uh, I want to get we want to get to the stage where the program uh, gives you an if-then-else type statement rather than the Kronecker delta. But the Kronecker delta is the obvious way to implement it as a mathematical function. So, so would that work inside another... Oh, yeah. Pro yeah. What's it called, or what data? Kronecker. I've got to remember how to spell it. Let's just take a look and I'll find it. This is a... K-R-O-N-I... I think it's called a Kronecker. I'll, I'll, I'll type it and see. Google will correct my spelling, fortunately. <coughs> Kronecker, K-E, okay? So what you're actually getting out of that, the value is zero if a condition applies, one if it doesn't, okay? And so you can state that as a mathematical function, and that's what's done down, well, that's done rather, well, that's rather easier to read than what we're doing in Minsky right now. What, when you put one of those into the model, it generates those two each time, okay? So I guess it'd be very messy to read, but that's that's the basic way it's implemented. So it's a mathematical function. Okay, so you can, uh, I, I, I'll show you, if you take a look at some of my models, you'll see I'm using that at various times to, uh, the main way I use it is in the model of with a, with a price system. And I don't, I have banks charging a premium above the inflation rate, but I don't want them to charge a premium above a negative inflation rate to say if the rate of inflation is zero then we charge a premium above zero not above minus one or minus two if that's the actual inflation rate and so i'll bring that one up actually i think i've got a version of that model fairly at hand let's see hang on so this is the an extended, a Minsky, extended Minsky model with nonlinear behavior to it, but I also have down the bottom here, um, if the rate of inflation is greater than zero, then add the base rate to the bank premium, else add the base rate to zero. That's what's going there. And the way it turns up as an equation I'll, is that mess there. Okay. So the whole equation is being evaluated at all times, but the Kronecker delta determines which part actually has an impact. Uh, so the coder of this is a pure mathematician, so hence we have those sorts of operators. So the godly tables have been improved, I've shown you that. Okay, um, and what I showed you as well is using the integral block to take an equation like that and express it in the terms that these programs use. So. You write them in differential equation terms, but because differential, a differential equation is checking the slope of a hill, the slope of a hill charges much more rapidly than the area beneath the hill changes. 
So in that sense, integration as a numerical operation is much more stable than differentiation. <coughs> but so you, you write it this way, you take if dkdt equals i minus k times delta for depreciation, then the integral of dkdt, which is k, is equal to the integral of i minus k times delta. So that's the basic way of writing it. And then in Minsky, it looks like this. Well, let's actually add that over here. So we've got a model at the moment without depreciation in it. What I want to have is have defined gross investment. So I'll say i, uh, I to score n rather for net investment. <coughs> and have that involving subtracting depreciation. So I'll take a copy of K, bring it down here, flip it around. I want to have depreciation. So, so, so I'll type backslash delta underscore K, so capital depreciation. Give it a value of, say, 0 0.6 with a maximum of 0 0.2 and a minimum of 0, except size of 0 0.01. That'll do. Flip that around. Make it into a parameter. It doesn't really matter whether it's a parameter or not. The, the only th trick about a parameter is that, first of all, we color it in blue. But secondly, there's no input to a parameter. Okay? For variables, there's an input as well as an output. Parameters is only an output, no input. If I now multiply k by delta k, that's the depreciation. Back over here. And then I subtract that from gross investment. And I get net investment. Take a copy of that. Whack it up here. Flip that around. Delete gross investment inside. Uh, net in gross investment. Take make a net investment. It won't make any qualitative change to the model at this stage but it's more realistic, there is depreciation, and it also does change the mathematical properties of the equilibria. I realized once I'd done, included depreciation inside there. Now, uh, let's, I'll just get rid of that switch block there in case it causes any problems. Okay. So there's our basic logic in doing um, the integral block. And what you get effectively, you turn the equation around, you flip it around. Okay, now so we've done all the stuff I covered here. Those are the values I've put, put into the model in, in this particular instance of it. And what you get is that cyclical behavior I've shown you a moment ago. So you've already got that. So this is working from what actually tend to be strict mathematical definitions. You get a system which generates cyclical behavior, not equilibrium. Okay. Do you want to solve for the equilibrium for that? How would you go about it? You would need to, what we're working here in terms of is absolute level of capital, absolute level of output, employment rate, etc, etc. You have to um, to actually work with the model and work at an equilibrium uh, level. Actually, well, yeah. Um, you need to work in terms of ratios. So the ratios that matter here are the employment rate and the wages share of output. Those are the two system states of the model. So I might just quickly show you what that is. I've got the wage rate here and the total wage bill here. If I divide the wage bill, take a copy of that, bring it down here, by output, divide the two, I get another system state called the wages share of output. And the way the Goodwin implemented that was using omega, which looks like a W in the Greek letter. And his model is in terms of the employment rate and the wages share of output. So I get rid of the wage rate there on the graph, take a copy of this, back it up there and flip it around. I'm going to get exactly the same sort of cyclical behavior, but in terms of wages shares, one system state versus the employment rate is the other. And you've got negative values for that as well. It's the numbers here are quite, they're, they're not sensible numbers yet. They're just showing the overall dynamics. Now, having done that, 
Um, what I would like to do is use some features of Minsky to make this rather more realistic because at the moment I have a fixed labor productivity ratio and a fixed population. So what you can do is right click and choose, let's see, edit that and make it back into a, make it into a flow or an integral. I'll choose, I'll actually make it into a flow first of all. So it'll change color to red. Now I have the option of add integral. So I've now got a, I can now say population changes over time. So the simple way to do that is have to have constant population growth. So I have um, N, which is population. And the, the term that uh, Goodwin used for the rate of growth of population was beta. So backslash beta. Give it a value, say 0 0.02, make that a parameter. Let's say a maximum of 0 0.05, minimum of 0 0.01. 05, let's say. You actually, you'd actually make that negative if you wanted to. In fact, you might as well. Let's say you have a possibility for negative population growth. Just make sure your step sizes are consistent. I've got to flip this around again. So beta times n will give you the actual population. Now check and see n is turning up as zero there. Oh no, I put that, well, that to the wrong end. I want to wire that to the top of the integral block. <coughs> I want an initial population. So I'll give that a value. I'll call this n zero. Let's have a popular a parameter called n zero, n underscore. Hang on. n underscore zero. And get that value, say, of 100 to begin with, make it into a parameter. Maximum, say, 200, minimum of 50, step size of 1. And wire that up to the bottom of the block. Now, let's all save that again with a different number, because I'm sure I'm going to cause a bug in doing this at some point. Okay, let's now simulate this. Okay, didn't cause a bug to happen. Now you've got a rising population. Now you can do exactly the same thing for uh, technical progress. So I've got A there as a constant right now. You can choose edit. If I make it directly into an integral, and give it an initial value of one, that'll do. Uh, where'd the integral block go? There should be an integral block. Okay. That did not happen properly. That should now be showing me add integral to that and hasn't done it. I found I've found another bug there. Okay, I'm going to go back and edit again. Make it into a variable, a flow. Now choose right click on it and there's add integral. So now I've got that as a integral as well. It's messy where it is. But that's we can we can live with that. So I now have have t constant labor productivity growth. That's going to be the value of a is going to be a times alpha. Where alpha represents the rate of technological growth. Let's give that say make that into a parameter. Get a value of say of um, 0 0.02. Ah. Watch out for that cursor moving around. Maximum of 0 0.05, let's say minimum of 0, step size 0 0.01. Okay, so A, A times alpha integrated is alpha. A straight um, constant technological change function. And I've got to fit an initial value as well. So I'll call this A underscore 0. You give that a value of 1, make that into a parameter, wire that to the bottom of the integral block. There's lots of tidying up to do here, you can see it's pretty messy. But again, let's click and save, okay. So I've now, got a, now notice it's got unstable over here. It's got the wage rate, I haven't got the wages share. 
I'm going to delete the wage rate variable there. Hang on a second. And wire up the wage a share of GDP instead on that limit cycle, and it should still be a stable limit cycle, let's see. Now, I've got something wrong going there. What have I done wrong? Well, I slightly disturbed my lecture today when I ran this model and what I expected to give me cycles that uh, remain the same magnitude all the time actually did this. And I spent a bit of time looking at the lecture afterwards and I realized what I'd done wrong. So I'm just injecting it now before you see the remainder of the lecture there. Notice I've got here, the rate of change of wages is the wage change function. And that is a very simple error because the differential equation for that actually is the rate of change of wages is the wage change function times the current level of wages. And uh, I think it's rather useful to have both the flowchart display of the model and the equation display because I managed to spot that looking at the equation display here. And if I just uh, come along here, if you look at the, where am I? The rate of change of wages is the wage change function. That made it rather more obvious in some ways than the wiring, though, because they both work rather well together. So that's what the model did, uh, set up with that mistake. And the reason I didn't see it is because the magnitudes of the wage change function were similar to the magnitude of the wage itself. Though occasionally it went negative, which is why I got a negative wage rate here. So I'm going to take a copy of that variable. Place it here, delete that wire, put in the multiply block, and wire the two together. Now the dynamics are going to be crazy wild because they didn't set the initial conditions up all that carefully. We made them up as I was going along in the lecture. Uh, we're now going to see much more severe cycles there, but this will now be a closed limit cycle. So let's just stop it and run it. And that's what should have been the case. Those cycles occurring all the time. These little things over here were probably due to converting variables which weren't integrals into integrals uh, initially. So I've got to check that up as a potential bug with with uh, with Russell. But that's cool. That now works. So I've actually already saved that as another file, so I won't bother saving it now. Now let's just take a look now at the other file where I had the first basic Minsky model with the same error included in it. <coughs> so again, I run this model and I get something looking like what I was aiming for as I found that after the lecture sitting down with um, with Nick and um, God, name freeze. <laughs> Sorry. And here we go. Yes, I got the result that I wanted, but it wasn't quite the right dynamics. You'll see we sort of go through a wormhole here and then collapse into um, a breakdown. I really shouldn't try to run build dumb make models after I had very little sleep watching Roger Federer play tennis last night at 3 o'clock in the morning. But anyway, that's life. So that's the um, the tunnel through to chaos effect that I wanted to get. But in fact, what's wrong again, the same story here. I've got to take a copy of the wage variable here. And I'll just actually whack this up here just to show that what changes in the system itself over on the equations. So you'll see, if I highlight here, I've got the wage rate of change of wages is the wage change function. It should be the wage change function times the current level of the wage rate. So I go back over here, I wire that up, delete that extra block there, put in the multiply, wire them together. Now take a look at that function again and you'll now see it's properly defined. So I've got the rate of change of money wages, is real wages, is the real wage multiplied by the wage change function. That's correct. And we now stop this and run it again. And it will have the classic behavior that I first discovered back in August of 1992 that you appear to be heading towards stability. Speed this up a bit. But in fact, you're passing through what's known as the Pomo-Manaville route to chaos. And the cycle will start to get larger on the other side. Which they're slowly getting to do. Yep. Okay. As I said, all arbitrary chosen numbers. Um, no necessary relationship to actual... Uh, empirical data, but you could fit the empirical data, you would find this dynamic which we experienced in the Great Recession, which was preceded by what the neoclassicals thought was the Great Moderation. But as this model, which was first constructed with nonlinear functions back in 1992, showed, um, 
that period of moderation is a lull before the storm. Okay, back to the lecture. Put up with all the crap where I say that I've got things wrong. That's the reason, as I said, was not having this function properly defined here. I'm not sure. That should not be on. That's actually coming in towards equilibrium now. So I've made an error there somewhere because that shouldn't happen with the Goodwin model. It might be because of depreciation. I'm just going to check and see. And set that to zero and see if that's what actually brought that shouldn't happen but it not nah, something else that I made a mistake somewhere else in that model I need to check and see why and that'd be a case of going across to these equations and checking them out unless we've got some numerical instability inside there which I don't think I should have that's diminishing cycles hmm and crazy values as well okay the numbers I made I just made them up as I was going there there's no realism to the numbers I've used here um, let's go back and check. So an investment coming in at 300, a value for V of 2, meaning 150, employment well exceeding the population rate. So I'm going to change my value for V to one that will give me a sense. Let's try for V equals 3 there. And now I never get an employment rate exceeding 100%, but I've still got that instability. I need to check and see why that's happening. I don't actually know. Looking at that screen right now. Anyway, um, what I should have had, I've made some sort of mistake there, and I've got to check and see what it is later. But in the Goodwin model, you, you get a, a closed loop. It's not actually a limit cycle. <coughs> Somehow I've made that to become stable. I'm not quite certain what I've done to make that mistake. But I'll check that later. Uh, but the basic instability, the basic nonlinearity there, is labour, the wage share of output, which determines the profit rate as well, is the wage rate times labour. Okay? And so you've got a quasi-quadratic there. And what that means is the further you go from equilibrium, the bigger that value will get to be, which means you're being thrust away from the equilibrium, means you're pulled back in again. And at a technical level, if you work out the, um, and I'm doing this, this probably next week's lecture rather than today's, when you work out the mathematical characteristic of this model, the real part of what's called the dominant eigenvalue of the system is zero. I've somehow made it negative, I'm not quite certain why. Now, how would a neoclassical criticise this? A lot of ways, wouldn't they? They're saying there's no optimising behaviour going on, you haven't got anything sensible behaviour, there's a fixed capital output ratio, that's all wrong, you know, for the stuff about um, about um, you know optimizing behavior, efficiency, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But you can actually show that this is this is the simplest possible model you can derive from real identities, and this is why I say you can have a different approach to building a dynamic model because we can define the employment rate as the level of employment divided by population. That's lambda. That's a definition. If you differentiate that with respect to time, you're differentiating a ratio. If you do that, you get 1 over n dl dt minus L over n times 1 over n dn dt. That's a simple application of the chain rule there. Now L here, we've defined to be output my, uh, divided by labour productivity. So I can substitute that into this expression here. And 1 over n dn dt is the rate of growth of population. So the way that the mathematicians indicate that is a hat over a variable. So hat over n means 1 over n dn dt, which is effectively the percentage rate of change of a variable. Okay. So I can substitute that into the equation. And now what I've got, I have, that's lambda, that's the employment rate, multiplied by n hat, so I've got that down here. This is 1 over n, and that's dl dt, that is ddt of y over a. Now y over a, Again, I can apply the chain rule there, and I get 1 over a, a times dy dt minus y over a times 1 over a da dt. Now that bit, da dt, is hat a. That's the rate of change of technical of labour productivity. Y over a is L. And I've now got an expression um, as I expand that out. I've got L over y. 
divided by n, I substitute this in for the property down for the hat, I've got 1 over y dy d turning up here with an L. I think actually I'm looking for a notation error. I think I made a notation error. So I need to go back and check that. A bit more working, and you get the rate of change of the employment rate is the employment rate times the growth rate minus the employment rate times the sum of labour productivity change and population growth. Finally, you get this equation. The rate of growth of labour, of la of the la employment rate is the rate of growth of the economy, GDP, minus the rate of growth of labour productivity and population. And that's simply a mathematical fact. That's not a model yet. It's simply putting in dynamic terms that relationship. Okay. Now the same thing could be done with that with wage share of GDP. That's defined as being the wage bill divided by GDP. Apply the chain rule to that. You actually could get rather simplified. The wage bill is the wage rate times labour. Output is labour times labour productivity. So you can cancel out the two L's and you get the rate of change of the wages share is the rate of change of the ratio of the real wage to labour productivity. And again, much the same working, just doing the chain rule to it. You end up with this expression saying the rate of change of wages share of GDP is the rate of change of wages minus the rate of change of labour productivity. So those are definitionally true. Then even a neoclassical can't object to that because we are working in terms of definitions. Now, to make it into a model, um, you have to add, add assumptions about the production system, um, the wage setting process, and so on. Once you've done that, you've got a basic model, okay? which is doing what you've shown a while ago. Now, I'm, I'm a bit annoyed that I've got a model that isn't um, um, giving me, it's giving us a stable system. I must have done something wrong there. I can't quite see it. But I'll live with that. Let's delete some of these extra blocks here. So what I wanted to go for is, is at the moment I have all investment, all all profit being invested. But what got me to the good one, to my the keen model, was saying, well, capitalists don't invest all their profit. They invest less than profits that are in a boom, in a slump, and more than profits in a boom, and they borrow money to make up the difference. So let's go and through and do that. I've got profit coming out here. I now want to go to investment, but have it going through an investment function of some sort. So what I'm going to have is exactly the same relationship that I've got over here for labour. I'm going to say divide profit by the value of capital, you get the profit rate. So I take a copy of K and divide profit by K. I get the rate of profit, which I'll call pi, uh, lowercase pi underscore r for profit rate. That's now the profit rate. And now build exactly the same model for capitalists' investment behaviour that I had for workers. <coughs> that capitalists have a zero a rate of profit at which they invest all their all their a rate of profit at which they invest all profit. Below they invest less, above they invest more. So same sort of basic idea. Let's define pi underscore z for the rate at which they will just invest what they earn. As they give that a value, make give it a parameter, give it a value, say, 0.03%, 3% rate of profit, say a maximum of, of 0.2, minimum of 0.01, step size of 0.01. So I now, if I subtract the actual profit rate from that zero profit rate, I get the gap between what they're what, the, what they're earning and what they the level that lets them just invest what they earn. Multiply that by a slope function, so pi underscore s for slope. I'll give that a value of ten as well. The same I gave for the workers. Give it a range, say twenty. To five with step sizes of one. Modify that together. You now have an investment function, so I'll call this I underscore curly brackets FN for investment function, close curly brackets. 
feed that into the investment function. Flip this around now. Now that I've got to multiply that by that, that's investment as a fraction of GDP. So take a copy of Y and multiply that investment function by Y. I get investment. I'm annoyed that I'm going to get a a wrong. Ah, oh, hang on, didn't do that. Uh oh, I type Control Z. I'm not quite certain what that's going to cause in the program. I just see. Um, I'll make this I underscore G for gross. Wire that up. So say gross investment is a function of the profit rate. And then net investment is gross investment minus depreciation. Now this is going to be, given that I've made an error there somewhere, this is going to circle in towards, which it shouldn't be doing. I've made some error there. I'll need to check it up for next week. But that's a basic model now involving investment by the um, capitalist sector where they invest more than their profits during a boom, less during a slump. Well, if, there's, if they're investing more than they've got, as profits, they have to borrow money. So the next stage is I'm a, I keep on pausing because I know I've, I, I should have a closed loop there and I'm not certain why I've got to open one. But I'm now going to have, if you'd have investment minus profits, which is up here, that's gross investment, minus gross profits. That is the rate of change of debt. So I now have, bring another variable in here which I'm going to call D for debt and I'll type the ampersand so I instantly get an integral block for it. Call that D for debt. Flip that around and wire that up to um, investment minus profits. And now that I've got debt there, you've got to pay interest on debt. So take a copy of that, flip that around, multiply that by the rate of interest on loans. So I'll say R underscore L, make that into a parameter, give it a value, say, of 0 0.05. Ah, 0 0.05 with a maximum of 0 0.2 and a minimum of 0 0.01. To, let's say with a step size 0 0.01 multiply the rate of interest on debt by debt and subtract that from output now one thing Minsky lets you do is overload operators where it makes sense to do so so I can add an extra input to the minus key on that subtraction block there and now going to output minus wages minus interest outstanding debt is the rate of profit so let's just, um, I'll save this before I have another crash. I think so? Ah, okay. This is basically a basic Minsky model. I'll save this first of all and check that. So you think I did that in the D, do you? Or oh, I think it was in the, the R, let's see. No, that's okay. Maximum of 2.20. Okay. Let's actually now simulate this and see what happens. That's a nice old convergence to equilibrium. And what I'm now realizing I'm not going to be able to show it properly is changing the slope of this investment function, varying it because I've there's some area I've introduced a, a um, an error into the logic that make the model converge in the first place. I'll make that a higher slope. Let's see what happens here. That's still going to converge. So I've got an error in the model. I know that's an error because what I was hoping to do is get the result. I'll show you one of these models I've embedded in here a moment ago. So I've got the basic idea investing. Uh, when profit is greater than 3% by borrowing money, 
paying it down when the rate of growth is lower than that. That's that basic expression from an earlier version of Minsky. And what you get is what I hoped to cause just then. So let's just make this a bit larger. So some I've got an error in that one that I've drawn so far. Let's just make it a bit larger again. Okay. So I have investment minus depreciation determining capital stock divided by the out capital output ratio giving you the output level divided by labour productivity giving the employment rate divided by that population giving the rate of giving employment divided by population you get the employment rate. Feed that through a reaction function of workers you get your Phillips curve. Multiply that by the real wage, integrate, you get the real wage, multiply by labour, you get the wage bill, subtract that from output, you get profit, divide that by profit, you get the profit rate, feed that into an investment function, you get the level of investment as a fraction of GDP, multiply by GDP, okay, that's what I should have got beforehand, a closed cycle. Has anybody got that themselves or you managed to introduce my error somehow? I'll need to go and compare that model over, over the weekend and see what I did wrong in that one. But that's the basic model without banks. Because you still get closed cycles with it. Now, what I introduced, what I tried to do then just a moment ago and stuffed up, was bringing in debt as an extra variable. I'm saying rate of change of debt is investment minus profits, and gross profits are output minus wages minus... Now, net profits are output minus wages minus interest and outstanding debt. That sort of relationship. When you add those to the model, where are we? Okay. Okay, so this is, make it a bit larger. So what I have here is exactly the same process as before, except that now I have, when the profit rate exceeds a set level, firms want to invest more than they've earned, investments minus profits give you the rate of change of debt, multiply that by the interest rate and subtract that from, um, where are I turn on profits here? From profits, where else is it, let's see. Okay, that's, that's the rate of interest there. I'm multiplying D by R and subtracting that from output as well as subtracting wages. And this is the classic model that I did back in uh, 1992. You get what appears to be convergence followed by divergence. Now, just let's bring that graph up here and can I flip the graph? I can't, okay, actually. This is a, let's put it over here, messy as hell, but that'll do. What you get is an apparent period, period of convergence followed by a divergence. Leading ultimately to collapse. So, um, I'm annoyed that I stuffed up doing the demonstration of that because I know I can't add it to this model and get that sort of behaviour. There is an error in there somewhere and I've got to find it. The sort of thing I can do sitting down, but sitting in front of a class of students, heaven help me, I can't find it. Okay, but that's that, that basic model there is exactly what I've shown you beforehand. Let's just stop that running. And what it gives you is Convergence to equilibrium, apparent convergence, followed by divergence. I would want to do, what's our time like right now? Is it half past five or what time is it? That's quarter past five. Too heavy to do today. I might make that, when's our next lecture? Is it next week or the week after? Next week. Next week. Give me a chance to check. Hang on. Put that in my diary. Yeah. Mm. Last week, then two weeks and one more week. That's right, yeah. Okay. So next week. Yep, okay, so next week what I'll do is I'll go through the mathematics 
of why that is unstable, what's actually going on behind it. And that involves looking at what are called eigenvalues, converting differential equations into matrix equations, and then looking at the characteristics of a matrix to work out the behaviour. It's the sort of stuff that you do to get a qualitative explanation of why a model's behaving in a particular way, but it only really works up to third order, a third order equation. Because you, I don't see many of you ever seen an equation for a, a quartic equation, the roots to a quartic, ever seen that? You don't want to, okay? If you wrote those, the roots to, you know, you know the roots to a quadratic, um, minus b plus or minus the square root of, it was minus c plus minus b squared minus 4ac all over 2a, nice and simple. The, the roots to a cubic are about uh, 20 times that size. The roots to a quartic are about 20 times that size again, and there are no roots to a fifth order. Okay? Period. Okay. Um, so I can't. Um, the, so therefore, the idea of exploring the qualitative behaviour of a model pretty much stops at a third dimension model. And if you go to four dimensions in a model, then what you find yourself doing is reducing it to a state where it's a set of three dimensions, where you lock down each of the other, the fourth dimension each time to see what the overall behaviour looks like. Um, so, in capitalism, one thing that I uh, like about this Goodwin model is I think it's got the full dimensionality of capitalism when you're working and looking at a scalar system. Okay. Obviously, I'm treating production as a single widget good, which is not true. But as a generic explanation for GDP as a variable, that's okay. We have three variables in the system. We have the employment rate, which fundamentally gives you the level of economic activity. We have the wages share of GDP, which gives you income distribution. And we have the debt ratio, which gives you the financial burden on the economy. Well, I think those three are the primary dimensions of capitalism. And when we're having those three, we're one ahead of the neoclassicals, we really have only two. They never see themselves in this sense, but they've pretty much got effectively just income distribution, if they even have that, and economic activity. So we're going one further to include the debt ratio inside there, and you can analyse that numerically and symbolically. So I'll take you through that load of heavy, heavy duty mathematics next week. Um, I've got to go and source what I've done wrong on this one. So I better go and do that. Should we leave it at that and next week? Okay. But <coughs> I'll just check if there's any more points I wanted to cover on the lecture itself. Let's see. Finding a couple of bugs there wasn't fun. Okay. What you get out of it, well, I'll, I'll talk about that next week and explain the overall dynamics. But that sort of behaviour is, is actually known as the pomo manaville route to chaos, which is one of the characteristics of a um, f fluid flow turbulence. And it turns up as a natural outcome of this three-dimensional view of capitalism. So next week. Okay. Hmm.